This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everyone. This is Ken and Michael uh, doing the training this week. Michael's going to kick it off with a review of the recent changes to, uh, to Dash. One of our primary focuses for this year is to improve all of our products to make them easier. So they're not all seemingly ACC tools but make them accessible to just about anyone and uh, that's the the focus of a lot of the changes we've made and some the changes that uh, Lubs and I will go through uh, today for you okay so with that Lubs take it away thanks Ken all right so I'm going to <clears throat> discuss some of the, the features we've added to the keystroke dash this is not going to be an overview of, of everything in dash um, just some of the features we've added in our most recent update um, and with that update um, it's still in the beta site, so if people go to our regular website to download, they won't have it. Um, but for any KPPs on here, if you want to, you know, try it out, um, I can give you the link to to download that for sure. Um, and here's here's the actual version here. Okay. 0 .50, 11.0.0.50. .0 All right. So <clears throat> the one thing um, that we wanted to add um, for a while now is the ability to filter, sort query, whatever you want to call it, based upon the actual activity type. So for example, meeting, call, um, in, our, in our database, any custom activity types, uh, X service, um, et cetera. Because <clears throat> currently, or I'm sorry, not currently, but prior, you really can only filter a query based upon the result of the history. Okay, so you can just say, show me all calls. Um, you'd have to go and sort by the, the result of all the calls. So you'd have to find all the results and then filter, add those to the query. So what we've added was is a is a field called activity type to the query. So let me show you how that works. Our query up here. <clears throat> so in the history, whenever we do a history table now, there's going to be a, a, an option that's been added. It's called activity type. Okay. Now this is going to be a little confusing because there's also a history type, and these two are not the same, but <laughs> but uh, when we look at the actual history, let me open the actual history up. Let's double click here. The type here, okay, even though this is a history, the type here, this is the activity type. So when you're doing a query and you want to find a certain activity type, this is this is the field you're using right here, okay? The result over here, the, behind the scenes in the SQL tables, the result is actually called history type. Uh, yeah, okay, I did that. We, you know, obviously it's confusing, but we cannot really change that in, in Dash. Otherwise, it'll break a lot of other things. So we can't label it result because, like I said, that'll cause a lot more damage. So in Dash, the the field that's result here is actually history type. Okay, so if we, I'm just going to set this over here, make it a little easier. So if we look at this list here, activity type in Dash equals the type here in history. Okay, history type here in Dash equals result in history. Okay, so that's just going to sort of be a training thing to, to teach users as they start using it. Once you start doing it, it just sort of, you know, you just sort of get used to it. But initially, it's going to be, I'm sure it's going to be confusing for a lot of people. Um, but like I said, the good thing is now we can we can filter by that particular field there, activity type. That was not in there before. Okay, so once again, when we go into our query and we choose history as our table to query on, Activity type will be there, history, and everything else will still be there that was there before. And as I mentioned, the result is not there. Results equals history type. So if you're looking to query on the actual result from the history box, that is going to be history type in the query dropdown. Okay. Any questions on on that particular part? Like I know, like I said, it's very it's a little bit confusing at first with with the differences there. And once again, it's really sort of out of our hands because it's the way Act refers to those fields behind the scenes. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> a couple other things we did, just sort of minor things, but um, very helpful tools, okay? Whenever you're looking at a list view in Dash, um, two more buttons have been added to the toolbar. And, then, and they're sort of stand out because they're orange. Um, the first one with a checkbox, that allows you to select things. So, or I'm sorry, select all. So if it's a large list, you don't feel like doing shift, and the first one and the shift always scroll all the way down to the bottom to highlight everything, you just click that button, it selects them all. Now, you know, why would you want to do that? Well, the main reason is, is if you do a query and maybe these are the phone calls you want to meet, 
make this week or people you want to follow up with. You can easily highlight them all, right click, go to contact. And it's going to pull up a list of those contacts in ACT for you. So let me let me tell you the the genesis of this. Um, Lubs is going to soon show you the the new campaign query feature that we built. And what I did was I used that feature to look up everyone that had an opt out or everyone that had a bounce, and it was a lot. So I then was trying to select them all and just instinctively went Control A, which did nothing. Okay, and then I thought, okay, well, if I'm thinking it's going to do something, I'm guessing a lot of other people will as well. I then knew to check um, Shift End, but we thought, okay, that's that's a little too complicated. So we created this uh, Select All and Deselect All for precisely that purpose, because I had thousands of records that came up, and I, just as Lub said, I wanted to look them up. So there was a, a clear use case based on this new chart that uh, Dash now supports, where we want to look up potentially thousands of, of contacts responding to the chart. Yep. And so as Ken mentioned, the button right to the right of it, without the checkbox, that deselects everything. Okay, so once you have it highlighted and you don't want to do that, or maybe you want to change what you want to, who you want to look up, you can deselect them all. Now it still has the ability to just, if you want to just highlight a few of them, you can just sort of drag them down like this. If you want to highlight just those few people, look them up, or you can sort of pick and choose with your control similar to any list before. So that's still there as well, okay? We just added a little more functionality there, once again, just to make it easy use for the customer, okay? So the next thing we wanna cover is what Ken sort of alluded to was campaign query. So let's just create a new, um, new dash here. And now in your panel here, what, what has been added is campaign, okay? Campaign query. So everything here is, is the same. You know, you select your table you want to look at, and typically you're going to want to do it with contacts because you want to see, I'm sure, the contact data. So let's just, um, it's anything. have you done anything recently, Ken, within the last week probably? Seven days? Yeah, ago? lots this week. Okay. okay, all right, we'll do that. Fields. And so now you have access to all those campaign fields. Okay, and we'll just put a few on there. Clicks. Bounce. Okay, and then there you have it. Okay. And there's your campaign for the last seven days. And once you're here, same thing goes here. You can, you know, you have the filter buttons on each of these. So if you want to see things that were bounced, you can click that button. Now be aware that this is one of the larger tables. If you do send out a lot of emails, so it may be a little slower than um, some of your other tables. So similar to the history, if you do any kind of dashes on histories and things like that. So I think we did, I think I did a list of this um with no query i think it was over one million items so i think there's a million items in our campaign table so um but you know x like any other table you can select them deselect them um export it to excel go to contact so it works as just as any other table and that's been added there so so just a quick review again so activity type has been added um the uh select and deselect records and then campaign query as a new, um, not a new table, but to Dash, it's, it's new to Dash. So, and that's, any questions on any of those new features? Hey, Michael? Yes. On those orange buttons, is there like a rollover that says what it does, like the other yeah. ones? My mouse, I made my mouse big because I have bad eyes, but um, if your mouse is small, you can actually see it. Okay, a better. thanks. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tool tips there, yep. Okay, I'm going to take the screen. Sure. There, there's a couple more Dash things that uh, I didn't know if you were going to cover, Lubs, because I was dealing with Dwayne directly on them. Um, if you've ever, it, this doesn't apply to KPIs, but if you're ever working with a list, so here's a campaign query list. If 
previously, if you double clicked on this, it would typically throw up an error unless you um, added a column for that particular um, ID with the results ID here, okay? But that results ID often was this long hundred, you know, character alphanumeric field that really cluttered up this chart. So what we've done in order, you can see here, I'm just gonna click on this, double click, and I can see the details of the campaign results. However, you don't see the a column for the results ID. If I go here, you can see the results ID here. Now let's remove it. Okay. It looks the exact same, but if I click on it this time, I get an error. And it says the campaign results ID column must be added. So what I asked Dwayne to do is I said, if we're gonna add them, I don't want people to actually have to see them. Okay, so a couple of things. It's not gonna go back and backport all of your um, existing dashes, but new dashes should show you the, um, automatically have the appropriate ID field included. Okay, and then if you remove it, you know, that's your choice, but you're going to limit the functionality. So now I've added this in here and I click on close, but like before, you're not gonna see it. Why is that? Because he made a change here, up here, where it says show ID fields. This is now cleared by default, okay? So the beauty of this is cleared by default, you can add in and you know make these things respond to double clicks where previously they wouldn't, okay? So this is something that, you know, it doesn't work in KPIs, but it works in um, in list view reports, and that's really, really handy. Okay, so just wanted to quickly review that. Lubs, did you cover that with him? Uh, no, thank you. That was, I didn't know about that one, so nice to know, learn about that one. Yeah, that was just something him and I were working on it, again, with mm -hmm. an eye towards making it, you know, as simple as possible, and right. obviously, and, and even in the KPIs, like here, if you double click on this, um actually sorry this is a list view um if you double click on this it's going to present an error we're, we're going to try to make that a little bit friendlier okay i just see a question here is there yeah, a way to refresh all of these at once refresh right right here oh, okay and okay. you can do it you can set the intervals i saw that too yeah whatever and time. i always said because that's typically the characteristic of a dashboard is that it's showing you live data so that was something that believe it or not the previous dash was supposed to have but there was no code for it okay so Dwayne finished that job but here's where i set up the automatic refresh 15 minutes for me is fine anything more obviously the the, the shorter the interval the more um the more overhead you're going to have. Okay. Hey, Ken. And, yep. I was going to say, go ahead and double click on one of those KPIs in service hours and show them what it does. It actually opens yeah. up a list view of those items. I'm not sure people are aware of that. Down at the bottom. So now you can see all the results that went into tabulating these 40 hours. Okay. And then you should be able, I think this is where you double click on it. Yeah. See what this is is because um, Dash is making a call for a designer layout that of course doesn't exist because I don't have it installed. And actually I have an appointment with uh, Austin to talk to him about what options there are to, to surface tables for act layouts. Okay, but we're all, whether we can do it or not, we're gonna capture that in a slightly friendlier uh, error message. Okay. Now, I'll tell you why this was really important to me, not only because you know I, I want people to have a, a better experience, but when you, um, when you added that field, that ID field, okay, because it was so long, it would often word wrap. And you know, instead of having these you know, neat and clean single line rows, you would end up with two, three lines high, okay? Thus, you know, showing you much, much less data on account of, of um, you know, accommodating data that made no sense to you, like the, the ID fields were utterly worthless. So it was important for us to have the functionality of that um, in the list, but not have the, um, 
not have it in view. So great work from, uh, from Dwayne on that. Any questions on that before we move on? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let's go to some of the linktivity changes. Okay. Now we're in a, um, a bit of a gap because Fajar is on vacation, but he's been working very, very hard on, you know, finishing up a lot of backlog items. So the first one you guys may have seen when you log in is this new yellow screen. Now, previously in the, in, in past iterations of the home screen, before we added all of these icons, the licensing information was kind of right the square in the center. But as we kept adding programs and improving the layout so that not only it was a more intuitive, but also a little bit more functional in mobile, um, that information kind of disappeared. So we've now added this big yellow box that will, uh, show you upcoming expiries, okay? So the following uh, subscriptions are expiring in 14 days. To renew your subscription, click manage subscription, so on and so forth, okay? This one's obviously showing one that um, expired 18 days ago, um, which isn't a problem because we obviously have a surplus of licensing for our link to calendar. But this is hopefully going to make it a little bit friendlier. When um, Fajar gets back, we're actually going to work on email notifications. And this was inspired by someone who we built a website for, and we actually set up their own link to forms page. Okay. The result of that, which we didn't consider a full year ago was that he would never actually log into his link to forms. He would just pay for it and accept the, the email feedback and the information going into act um, from his website. So the point is when it expired, he didn't get any notifications because he was never logging in. So we're building this to make it a little bit more conspicuous. And then we're going to have the outbound emails uh, probably sometime in February. Okay, so that's the, the first thing at the linktivity level. If you go to the purchase subscriptions, you're gonna notice down here, um, you've seen us talk about the solopreneur uh, bundles. We're really, really keen on this. We, I mean, we talk all the time about team um, and uh, standard tiers, but we also know that when we did a, uh, a lookup in our database, of the number of accounts that had one to three users, there was over a thousand of them. So we know that the solopreneur, um, you know, um, customers are out there and they're out there in large numbers. So to them, you know, talking to them about extra features of Teams, we may as well be uh, speaking in Urdu. So what we thought we'd do is we'd build a bundle that is a little bit more in line with what their needs are and give them the ability to uh, build a little bit of the, it themselves. So when they click on purchase, they're immediately going to get link to list, link to calendar. Now those two things, link to calendar just because it's the most popular. Okay, virtually everyone gets that, that gets any LinkedIn product will get linked to calendar. Link to list, because we believe that if you're gonna use AMA, that's something that is absolutely mandatory. So we've built that in. Then we've got link to shrink, which is like bit.ly as we all know. And then we've got link to sync. So we've got, um, and I know some people say, well, you know, how many people really use link to sync doesn't really matter. The difference in terms of the bundling is a savings of 33% versus 40%. So it's not like someone's going to love it at 40% and hate it, hate it at the 33% discount. We're just throwing that in. So if they find that useful, then it's great. Now, the last piece though, is that they get that base of a bundle and then they choose themselves what that final piece is. Now, the reason that this is important when you think about it is that if you're dealing with a financial planner, they're never going to quote. They're never going to quote. That's not their business. And they're um, not likely to use uh, forms for the simple reason that the majority of them are wearing, you know, um, Asante or IG or some other large brokerage firm, and they have no access to their website. Okay, so forms doesn't really make a whole lot of um, use for them. However, events where they're organizing lunch and learns or surveys where they're going out. And remember, a lot of these financial planners have to comply with what's called KYC audits, know your client audits. And being able to do this allows them to survey their customers, kind of get a pulse 
of you know what their their risk tolerance is, what their interests are, and this allows them to to do this in a much more time efficient way, and based on their responses, generate leads that they might not otherwise be aware of. So if you're a financial planner, one of these two things will be of interest to you. Okay. Similarly, if you are selling widgets, quotes is likely going to be a keen thing. So what we're doing is we're allowing people to pick and instead of paying $462, they're paying $278. This red just means my reseller discount. Okay, so a really, really big discount. And basically it's $23 a month for five programs. Okay, an entire suite of programs. So we're pretty stoked about that. We've modified the, um, you know, even the, our quoting system to support that kind of flexibility where you've got a base and then you can um, select that final piece. But we're pretty stoked about that and we've uh, been marketing quite a bit and we think this is gonna be a good uh, lead generator down the road. This is, we, we cast this as our, our product of the month, but really we're gonna keep it on an open-ended basis. If it ends up, you know, um, not being of any great appeal to people, then we'll consider um, whether we keep it, you know, in six months or a year. But right now I think it's got a place and um, I love what uh, Fajar has done in terms of simplicity here, okay? So those are the two big linktivity changes um, in terms of the entire suite. If we go over to link to lists, okay? Actually, I'm gonna go back to the purchase here, okay? So here, if you purchase, previously we had a rule where if you um, inventoried your, your, your scans, okay? So let's say you bought it 25,000 scans. And at the end of your, your subscriptions, let's say your subscription was on January 30, ended on January 31st and you let it lapse, then these expired with your subscription. So if you came back a month later, then the only scans that you would have would be those free 500 you get with every uh, renewal. We actually reviewed that and we thought that's that's not a great customer experience. They can let their cut their subscription lapse, but if they come back at a later date, okay, and they renew it and you know the account's still there, then they should have access to it. So that's what we've done. These things no longer expire with the subscription. We think that that's a better uh, customer experience. So let's say that there are people that are much more seasonal based. You may find that, you know, again, back to financial planners, they may want to advertise a lot in Q1. We're in Canada, that's the RRSP deadline. Um, in the United States, um, you know, they, I'm not 100% sure. I know that the tax deadline is April 15th. I don't know when the investment vehicles, but typically it's in Q1 um, when they expire. So they may want to advertise a lot then. And if their subscription, let's say, expires in April, they may not need for several months to do any more emailing. This allows them to say, come back in the fall, okay, renew their subscription and have all of their unused scans left ready to use. So. Like I said, I think that that's uh, a better customer experience. Um, moving on to link to forms. Link to forms, um, you know, one of the things that I found when we were working with uh, fields is when we wanted to add, dates weren't available, okay? and if you wanted to set a time where like, let's say some people can indicate when they wanted follow-ups or things like that, whatever, even if it's mapped to an internal field that you wanted that information to be passed on to act, there wasn't a vehicle for that previously. So we added a date field and that displays as a mini calendar, like when you, not a mini calendar, sorry, it, it displays as a um, um, kind of a, a date field mask. Okay, so you can actually see it as, um, you know, depending on your regional settings, YYY, MM, DD, however. Okay, so it's very, it will display and reveal itself very quickly as a date field. So that's been added. We've also added support for annual event fields in the mapped contact fields so that, you know, let's say people wanna add in uh, their birthdays or such, that information can be passed back to ACT, okay? Now, as everyone knows, we probably push the edge of the envelope the most with linked quotes. So let's just go into linked to quotes, okay? And one of the big things that we always get asked, okay, is, let me just go back down here. 
let's take a look. Okay, here is a quote. Okay, just standard generic quote. And we've always had this PO number field. So people would enter in their information. If they didn't want, if they're a larger company and they always want to issue POs, they would just put it in there. And this information would be passed on to the sales rep. The problem was that it would not get passed back to ACT. Okay, so there wasn't any field mapping with that. So what we did under settings, go under field mapping, you go under opportunities, you're now going to see a PO number field. Okay, now if you go in here and you haven't set this up, it's going to be blank. You'll have the option to create it or map it or do whatever. On the weekend, I created this field. So now it's not only in our database, um, but um, mapped. So what this means is when they submit it, it will actually be passed on to the appropriate field in the opportunity so that any admin staff that may not have access to um, link to quotes or linktivity um, can actually see right within ACT what the PO field was for the closed one opportunities. Okay, so this was something that was requested, I think, by Shannon or one of her customers. I thought it was one of those DAHA things where uh, absolutely it should be there. So we got that in there. Okay, um, pretty self evident, but is there any questions on that? Okay, Groovy. The other big one, um, and I demoed this, I think, a couple of weeks ago, but I'm just going to just show it one more time and I'll kind of go back to this, the same quote. Okay, and that is now you've got the bundles. Now, previously, when you clicked on bundles, you would be prompted to build them. Okay, but now you click on bundles and you can actually select from the saved bundles that you've got. Okay, or if you go into the products, you can click on filters and say type product bundle and see all your filters. Okay, now you can see Sylvia has um, translated every single one of them. But let me just show you um, one of the reasons, even though I showed this to you, I haven't showed everyone the final iteration. So here you can see um, the standard descriptions. This price override feature is incredibly important. OK, because for that bundle, for instance, that's going for two hundred and seventy eight dollars, I would then put in the price override because normally a bundle will aggregate all the um, the items in it. OK, and basically show you the the total price of all the you know, it's basically the sum of the uh, the parts. OK, this allows you to override that sum and apply a special price that overrides the total. Okay, in this case, that bundle is extremely important. Okay, but I'm gonna kill this and I'm gonna show you the big thing here that we've got. You can see here that we've got all the, the component parts, but now we have an option group. And what the option group allows you to do is if you put in um, option the same option group here, okay and the same option group here then these two items within that bundle will be mutually exclusive okay so let's say that you had a bundle um and again just without getting too deep of a dive when you're using mutually exclusive items within a bundle that has a price override you have to uh, well you should use components that are of the exact same price because you're allowing someone to pick one item or another within a bundle without changing the price. So if you give them the choice of a more expensive item, okay, you do stand the, to, you know, obviously drive people's preference to that, but also, you know, be giving them maybe a bigger discount than you intended. Okay, so generally save um, the, the bundles within a bundle Okay, for the option groups for two items or more that have the exact same price, just like we did with the uh, the solopreneur. We would have these parts here, and I can actually show you what that looks like. Go here, 
Okay, you can see how all these four are included. And these last four all have solopreneur as an option group, making them all mutually exclusive. Meaning if I select one, it will deselect the other. Okay, and that was, those options will be presented to the person that you're quoting as well. Okay, and again, just trying to keep building on, you know, more and more flexibility and power, um, you know, in our quoting process, because if you can give people the, um, the option to engage with the quote, okay, without, you know, calling you up, having questions between a prospect and a salesperson are great. Asking, having that prospect asking you to make changes that you can empower your quoting system to allow them to make, that's better. Okay, you don't want them, you know, just going back and making clerical changes when the quoting system should be able to make those uh, autonomously available to the prospect. Okay, so that is what I wanted to cover uh, the changes to Linktivity, link to list, link to forms, and then link to quotes. Any questions before we wrap up? Okay, I don't see anything. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, as um, we indicated at the beginning, this event is recorded. Um, you're going to see in this week and the subsequent weeks, a real continuing, uh, if not increasing emphasis on making not only all our products better, but easier to use. And if you guys have any suggestions to that end, please let us know because it's something we're really committed to achieving. Okay, so if I don't speak to any of you before the end of the day, I wish you all a great weekend and thanks for attending. Take care.